She checks one by one for the good egg, for her son, the good egg, and for her grandson, slowly starting to spoil. Her shoulders weigh heavy like the soured curds in once fresh milk. Her once fresh face weighs heavy in the fading store. With the chicken box tucked under one arm, she carries him a small slice of city spice, pinches soldered tears from burnt eyes, and pulls apart that crinkly brown wing skin one by one. Scoop, scoop, rattle, rattle, bones in flailing skin, chains on used dream cars, bulletproof shaky glass between him, them, and bruised apples. Hot sauce to go with your pain? Arnold Palmer to soothe the pangs. They call it a half and half here. In the city, half-starved, half-gorged, fuchsia lights like artificial juice packs, white powder, dusting donuts and streetlights. Homes on sleeves, hearts on stoops. Ten years ago, I fell deeply in love not once but twice, first with public health and shortly after with Baltimore. It happened as I was walking out of the Harriet Lane, a Johns Hopkins pediatrics clinic in East Baltimore, and into the sticky mid-Atlantic air, which was filled with delicious wafts coming from Eastern Market, and the clanging of voices as patients rotated in and out of the hospital. Just a few months earlier, I'd arrived here at the Homewood campus. I was shiny-eyed and knew very little about the city that I was about to spend my next four years in. I did know one thing for sure, or at least I thought I did. I know you guys have already heard a lot of BME and Asian parent jokes today, but I'm going to pile one more on there. Um, and that was that breaking with all stereotypes, I had come as a first generation Asian American to Hopkins to be both a biomedical engineer and a doctor. Very revolutionary, I know. Um, but one day, as I was walking out of the library, which, like any good Hopkins nerd, is where I spent most of my days socializing, I was struck by the realization that I had never stopped to really think about whether I truly believed in what I was doing. Thinking about the inner workings of the body, building life-saving devices, these are all incredibly essential things, the things that my best friends and fellow Hopkins alumni would grow up to build careers around. They just weren't my things. So the next day, I stumbled across a public health symposium in Remsen Hall, not too far from the stage. All of a sudden, this topic that I'd only, until then, vaguely associated with avian flu and fluoride in the water came alive for me. Public health was healthcare turned inside out, this discipline dedicated not just what happens inside the body, but everything that surrounds it lives, communities, societies, to me, it just makes sense. It's about the push-pull between the care that we receive and the realities of the world that we live in. I was hooked, and I jumped in head first. But soon, that initial headiness, that first infatuation, started to die away. I sat in lecture after lecture where my professors would talk about how health disparities in Baltimore are some of the worst in the country. You guys have heard the statistics, right? Infant mortality that's double that, the national average. Life expectancy in certain neighborhoods in Baltimore City that is lower than the life expectancy in Rwanda or Nepal. But why? My own university's hospital, the best healthcare institution in the world, sat just blocks away from where these healthcare injustices were happening. If patients in Baltimore theoretically have access to some of the best medicine, why is our collective system failing to deliver actual health on their behalf? It's not just illogical, it's infuriating. Devon is in daycare. He drinks apple juice, dark auburn, like the blood they draw at the clinic. Tonight, dinner is PB&J. PB on the periodic table, the table, the floors, the walls, the lab reports. Mrs. Jones sweeps. The tears she weeps are lead stars, bulleting down into the dust. Now, unfortunately, the puzzle of health disparities is really complicated, and assigning blame to any one institution or system or policy isn't really that helpful. Those of us that work patients, especially here in Baltimore City, we know the barriers that prevent care from converting into health. Poverty, structural discrimination and inequality, lack of access to essential resources, these are deep-rooted challenges that no single individual or institution or system can possibly peel back. So then the question becomes, can we do anything at all in the face of these seemingly impossible problems? Is it even worth trying? The summer before my sophomore year, 
I had the opportunity to work with the Baltimore City Health Department, former Baltimore City Health Commissioner, Dr. Josh Sharfstein, and a group of amazing public health pioneers, students and faculty here at Homewood, at the medical campus, community-based organizations, health department staff, and more, to found the Baltimore Site of Health Leads, a national organization that envisions a healthcare system that addresses all patients' basic resource needs as a standard part of quality care. Health Leads is radical in how simple it is. In the clinics where the organization operates, members of the clinic team can write prescriptions for the basic resources that patients need to be healthy. Things like nutritious food, heat in the winter, transportation to the pharmacy. And patients can then take those prescriptions over to where our trained advocates sit in the clinic waiting room. In my case, they were college students, but you could imagine them being community health workers or navigators or any other workforce. And those advocates will work side by side with the patients to ensure that they connected to the services that they need. One of my first patients at the Harriet Lane was a young mom who had just been to the emergency room for the third time that month due to her son's exacerbated asthma attacks. She was exhausted. She and her three kids were living in a dilapidated old Baltimore City row home with 12 other people, with asbestos dust on the floor and peeling lead paint on the walls. She was working two jobs, trying to make ends meet, but neither of those jobs offered great benefits. She often didn't have enough food on the table at the end of the month, and she was at risk of losing, if not one, then both jobs, because of the time that she was taking off to attend to her son's medical care. So her pediatrician listened to all of this and decided to write two prescriptions, one for an inhaler for the asthma and another for food and housing. And then she brought the family over to me. I began talking with the mom, you know, hearing her story, trying to think through the options. And I remember she was so weary and she leaned over the desk and looked me straight in the eyes. And she said, I just want a house that's actually a home and that will stop killing my kids. I have told that story a hundred times, and I will continue to tell it, because for me, that was when health and patient went from being abstract theories to being deeply personal. Health was now this young family right in front of me. So we jumped in together. We looked into whether we could enroll the family in medical assistance so that at the very least, they weren't having to face exorbitant ER bills anymore. We also found the mom a job placement program that she could enroll in so that there was a nurse certificate at the end. And we were also able to put in an application for SNAP, food stamps. Little by little, the family was able to save up just enough additional dispensable income to move into a different house in a nearby neighborhood at a slightly higher rent. It was a small move, but it had huge implications for both the health and the quality of life for that family. But on that day, before all of the rest of that unfolded, I was really only left with the look conveyed from her eyes into mine. And so rather than hop on the shuttle back to campus, I decided to walk. I walked past the hospital dome, past the Douglas homes, past Dunbar and Sojourner Douglas and the health department clinic at Eastern, symbols of a city and health so intertwined yet often so disconnected. All around me, there were these narratives just waiting to be told. Two kids on the corner gleefully draining sugar from their pixie sticks, a grandmother sitting in her rocking chair staring off into space, a provider in scrubs escaping from the hospital for a quick smoke before whisking away. Stories, all part of the indestructible fabric of Baltimore. Like, take this corner. Who knows her story, rounded, sharp with time? Children dervishing through, laughing with abandon as their legs turn lightning around the corner who thinks, here is my cemented purpose to provide safe passage, bear big dreams and false hopes, play canvas to contraband, to provide the ability to shield against siren song, to swallow hot metal when small wars pull apart the faces of young soldiers with hands up and thoughts far away. They are lost, but they are found here, on the corner between what is and can be. So that night, 
when I came home, I picked up my notebook and I started writing. It felt important to me to do right by the lives of the patients that I was being invited into, into this city whose life that I was being invited into and sharing the stories of the people that I was meeting felt like a small step in that direction. That one encounter at Harriet Lane grew into dozens more across the city and what I thought was just gonna be a simple student volunteering opportunity turned into a social mission that completely transformed my life. And from a distance, it's that story, the one of how Hopkins and public health and health leads infused my life with meaning and allowed me to see beyond the traditional definition of healthcare that is the defining one, the one that I fall asleep to and wake up with. But often, it's the narratives that really wake us up that are rougher around the edges. They make us uncomfortable because they're not finished, and they may never be. Last May, I returned to Baltimore as part of a cross-country bus trip. The visit had been planned for months, but just a week prior to coming back into Baltimore, the unrest following Freddie Gray's death had wrapped the city into a sudden uncertainty. Led by friends, we made our way down to the lawn in front of City Hall, where there was a peace rally being held, hosting Baltimoreans all fresh from church in their Sunday best. But all around the lawn were media and camera crews looking totally disinterested in what was unfolding right in front of them. On my phone screen, the images that the talking heads continued to point to were of fire and broken buildings and frustrated residents as if no other version of Baltimore could possibly exist. The crowd began to sing. And I stood there, heartbroken and hopeful, back in this city that I had come to love but had been away from for so many years. And I asked myself the same question that had popped into my head 10 years prior here on campus. What did I really, truly believe in? I believe that every person has the right to a healthy life. I believe in Baltimore, and I believe in doing something about your beliefs. Last December, I returned to the city as a proud community member and as chief policy and engagement officer for the Baltimore City Health Department. I get just as mad about health inequities now as I did at 17. And I'm fortunate to work with an innovative health commissioner, Dr. Lena Wen, who believes deeply in using public health as a tool for social justice, as well as an amazing staff at the health department that knows that to really move the needle on health outcomes, you have to pay attention to the realities of patients' lives. There's really nowhere else that I'd rather be than in this city where I truly grew up. So my love story with public health is my ode to Baltimore. It's here where I've seen the possible, the patient that's able to break free from a chain of never-ending emergency room visits, citywide health collaboratives that are built foundationally on this idea that patients live multiple robust chapters of their life. I know that we can make those stories the norm, not the exception. Together, we can all write a new vision into being, that an entire city and every individual in that city has the opportunity to be healthy. Every stoop, every heart, every home. Thank you. <laughs>